Okay, fine. So yes, so welcome everybody. I'm very happy to have uh, Mariana and Olena with us. Uh, they are going to uh, present, uh, I think it's going to be an interesting talk. They're going to present us and give us some input about the Ukrainian language and the, Ukrainian, the history of the Ukrainian language. Uh, and the specific also um, characteristic traits of the Ukrainian language and also the history of teaching the Ukrainian language and the impact of the history, um, also the latest history and the war uh, on the teaching of this language. Uh, both of them are um, at the Leaf uh, Catholic University within the School for Ukrainian um, Language and Culture. And uh, I'm happy to introduce to you Mariana Burak. She is the academic director of that school. And Olena Sintrak, she's the head of the bachelor's program and is a teacher of Ukrainian herself. And I was also told that when we prepared this uh, webinar that both of you prepared also some interactive parts for us. So we will be challenged. And so we're very much looking forward to you. And the floor is yours, Olena and Mariana so much and uh, just let me first share uh, my presentation before I start and just yes. okay so good afternoon I believe you though <clears throat> for me it's still good morning mm -hmm. yeah. I'm a bit out of vo voice but anyway um, so my name is Mariana Burak, and um, as Sabine already mentioned, Academic Director of the School of Ukrainian Language and Culture at the Ukrainian Catholic University. So it's my job to present our school, which I'll be doing in a moment. Uh, but before that, I'll just want to express my gratitude to the administrators of the circles for this invitation and especially for the great initiatives to support Ukraine by enhancing this cooperation with the Ukrainian academic language programs. Um, I want also to thank you all for taking the time from your busy schedules to meet us here and learn more about Ukrainian language and language education in Ukraine. Um, however, Professor Olena Sinchak and I will be speaking to you today in deep sorrow as it was this morning that a farewell ceremony and a memorial service were held in our city for the late Artemy Demet, the son of the first rector of our university on its reopening in Ukraine. Um, Artemy was a young, highly educated activist who was raised in the community of our university. He was a great grandson of a well-known Ukrainian historian, a historian himself, a man of honor and principles, a potential leader of the future strong and democratic Ukraine, and he was killed by the Russian invaders last Saturday. It was a great loss for all who have hope in better future, the loss which is unfortunately neither the first nor the last one in this war. Artemi's parents are establishing a scholarship named after Artemi Demut for the university students. And I believe the great initiative is worth supporting. Though it was not our original intention, but this presentation will be a tribute to Artemi and all those who were our future, but who now will stay only a part of our past, its best part. On the example of the history of the Ukrainian language, Professor Sinchak will today talk to you about the events and processes which directly or indirectly led to current war. A war not only for the territory of Ukraine, but also or moreover for its very identity. Ironically, this presentation about Ukraine will be delivered by two Ukrainian professors, neither of whom are in Ukraine now. And this is also a part of the Ukrainian reality these days. And now let me start our presentation with the introduction of the School of Ukrainian Language and Culture, or simply so. 
Um, but I believe that to understand one's soul, we in fact need to meet the body first. And here's our body, our main body, which is home to our soul, the Ukrainian Catholic University. It's complex history reminds us of the complexity of the history of Ukraine itself, its past and its present. Founded in the late 1920s as a theological educational institution, it was closed and banned by Soviets immediately on their invasion of the Western part of Ukraine with the students and professors sent to exile. However, between 1944, when the acad academy was reorganized into the Ukrainian Catholic University and settled in Rome, and 1994, when it returned to independent Ukraine, the university was developing abroad. And in my opinion, the fact of this separation of the institution from its home environment for half a century, uh, though tragic by its nature, appeared to be beneficial in terms of isolation from the Soviet ideology and its impact. And as a result, on its returning to Ukraine in 1994, the Ukrainian Catholic University had become a unique institution of its kind, a true alternative to the traditional post-Soviet education in modern Ukraine, a Western type institution based on democratic principles. The main pillars the modern Ukrainian Catholic University is based on are first um, high moral standards, as the mission and vision of the university are based on basic Christian principles. Second, high academic standards, as the university realizes its high mission in both raising respectful and responsible Ukrainian leaders, and also enhancing the international collaboration of great minds to make the world a better place for all of us. And finally, the community-based programs, as our main vocation is to serve, to serve our students, to serve our country and the mankind. Um, it was in this beautiful body that in 2002, our soul was born, and since then, it has been home for over 1,300 students. Starting off as a small program for the university's guests, donors, or faculty and staff members from abroad, who primarily wanted just to learn the language for their everyday needs. The school has eventually developed into a well-known language center with a variety of credit-bearing programs, high-quality language teaching materials, shared projects with the Ministry of Education uh, of, uh, in Ukraine and with multiple international institutions. So here's our soul at a glance. As of now, the school has developed eight on campus and five online programs. And we'll have a closer look at them in a moment. Language courses are delivered at six proficiency levels, ranging from the beginner level to advanced, with each student having their level assessed by pre-course placement test and uh, interviews. Each program can be done at two levels of intensity, standard and intensive with two or four hours of language classes daily correspondingly. Over time, the soul has elaborated its methods of teaching. And as a result, it has published a well-known series of course books with several new course books coming soon. The Soul Talks is our monthly online speaking club allowing those who are eager to speak Ukrainian meet other learners from all over the world and practice the language. Whether an enrolled student or not, everyone is welcomed. To raise a new generation of teachers of the Ukrainian language, the school has designed a course in methods of teaching Ukrainian and offers it to our domestic students of linguistics annually. Apart from this, Seoul has been home to a number of professional development seminars for language teachers. Our school intensely cooperates with other language departments in the Ukrainian Catholic University, other universities in Lviv and Ukraine. 
As members of the working group, our faculty members participated in the process of creating the national standards uh, of the language proficiency for the Ministry of Education of Ukraine. And Professor Sinchak, our today's speaker, was one of the authors of the adopted standard. As an educational institution, we have established close cooperation with various foreign institutions, educational, religious, and governmental in different parts of the world. Countries of the European Union, the UK, the USA, Canada, Australia, and we believe that there are many more yet to be established. The progress of each of our students is tracked and on students' request, we send the university credits to their home institutions. Over the last 12 years, more than 180 transcripts were sent to different educational institutions in the mentioned countries, and the credits were successfully accepted by them. As of now, our school offers uh, programs in two formats, offline and online. The three seasonal programs are spring, summer, and fall, with the summer program being the most intensive and most popular. Before the lockdowns and the war, our summer programs used to welcome about 100 students from over 20 countries each summer. And they included a two-week Carpathian program where the students were immersed into the Ukrainian ethnic environment with splendid mountain landscapes, exciting trips, and creative workshops with the local craftsmen, and followed by a Lviv city program, which included visits to UNESCO heritage landmarks, memorable um, art events, unforgettable meetings with famous Ukrainians. We are confident that the moment we win the war, our programs will again be a balanced combination of academic education and sightseeing fun, as they used to be. We believe that each program day will again consist of Ukrainian language classes with experienced and highly trained instructors, tutoring where students meet one-on-one -on -one with native speakers who are usually pre-trained students of linguistic programs and practice the language or do their home assignments together with them. Um, lectures, which are delivered by prominent researchers, artists, or activists and cover interesting topics on history, political studies, business, and culture. And extracurricular activities, which are actually afternoon activities and include excursions, culture events, workshops, and speaking clubs, and are aimed at immersing our students into the peaceful and vivid Ukrainian life. In the meantime, due to the circumstances, we are hosting our seasonal programs online via Zoom and on our university CMS based on Moodle. However, I must say that the programs proved to be not less successful among our students than the on-campus ones. We are optimists in planning our future programs as exemplified by the list of 2023 courses, which will both invite our on-campus students to visit university and will also continue providing the online teaching for those who will opt to learn the language from the comfort of their home. Along with our group programs, we have two kinds of individual courses, um, both in online and in uh, in-person formats. These are courses of general Ukrainian and Ukrainian for specific purposes. They are both highly personalized and tailored to meet students' needs either in mere everyday communication or in their professional activity as diplomats, businessmen, doctors, researchers, etc. Our school also offers study courses to universities and groups visiting Ukraine for short time. 
study tours for high school universities and university students, um, integrate fun with learning beyond the classroom experience and are always tailored specifically for group needs. Professional internship. So in addition, we provide this kind of programs for both international students and domestic students of the Ukrainian Catholic University. On completing a semester course in methods of teaching, the Ukrainian Catholic University students majoring in linguistics take an internship program where the interns are trained to develop teaching materials and deliver classes to real international students. As mentioned, we are also known to the world by our series of Yabloko textbooks, written by a group of educators according to the latest methods of teaching languages. It is packed with practical lessons, handy cultural facts, and essential references. The textbook has become so popular that we are printing, printing out its third edition these days. And finally, the most recent project of ours, Eye Openers on Ukraine. It's a series of online lectures aimed at the global community eager to understand what is really going on in Ukraine. The lectures are delivered by prominent historians, philologists, political scientists, and social activists who share their ideas about Ukraine from the perspective of the ongoing war in our country. In the lectures, one can learn about the history of Ukraine as a state, its achievements over the last 30 years, uh, Ukraine's role in two world wars and the ongoing war, Ukrainian revolutions of the past 20 years, and the history of the Ukrainian language. The condensed version of the latter will now be presented to you by Professor Olena Simchak. So welcome to our school, welcome to our soul, and please welcome Professor Sinchak, who will now speak about the Ukrainian language in a more interactive way. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mariana. Mariana, could you please? Um... Yeah, I, I'm... Naming uh, you. Mariana, maybe you can uh, show the presentation and I will just talk. Is it possible? You can just... you can show it now, Olena. Mm -hmm. Sometimes uh, no, no. Are you sure? I just yeah. I just name new co-host. No. No. You made David little look. I will try sometimes. <laughs> oh, I... sorry, sorry, I'm. <laughs> Uh, sometimes my computer makes it difficult. Um, so um, we should try first if it's go or not. Do you see? It's go? Yes. It yes? Oh, it's, ma it's magic. <laughs> it's not so easy. Uh, so dear colleagues, it's a big honor for us to um, present to you on the topic, the distinctive features of the Ukrainian language in wider cultural context. Um, in this webinar, we will trace the brief history of the Ukrainian language since the 6th century until now. We will investigate the effects of the Russification policy on the Ukrainian language for the last two centuries. We will also outline the specific features of the Ukrainian language and measure the lexical distance between Ukrainian and Russian language. And finally, we will talk about connection between language and identity in contemporary Ukraine. Unfortunately, COVID has stolen my voice. I hope you still can hear me. Yes, yes. <laughs> it's good. So, Olena, sorry to interrupt. Can you can you show the switch to the presentation mode? Then we will see that we will see the whole screen. Ah, uh -huh. you don't see the whole screen. Here is the problem. Sometimes it's um, I yes, I understand. Yeah, um, and now. No, no. So, sometimes my computer makes it difficult. It's needing a little bit time. And what's about now? It's the no, same. It's the same. Yes, it's here. It's a problem. Um, what's about now? Try clicking. Try clicking on the main part of the screen, then going into the. Uh -huh. Then. Um, 
now it's not it's the same yeah sometimes it's happened mariana uh, could you please help me with if you if you could uh, uh, Okay, I'll just try to share. Just give me a second just to find yours. Okay. And uh, let me try sharing the screen now. Um, yes. Can you see the presentation? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah that, that's fine. Thank you very much. <laughs> Please, second slide. Uh -huh. So, uh, we will talk about uh, sources of linguistic history, direct, irrefutable evidence. And let's go next. Um, can you recognize the place where it is located? What do you see here? Do you know? An Orthodox church. Yes. Yeah, I don't know where, but it looks like an Orthodox church. Yeah. Yes. That's right. A church. Yeah, it's the oldest, probably the oldest Ukrainian church, uh, St. Sophia um, Cathedral, built in Kyiv at the beginning of the 11th century. Uh, Yaroslav Mudry, which has built this uh, church, founded a scriptorium a workshop for copying books equipped with a large library, uh, qualified scribes and artists. This is where the oldest manuscripts came from, the Ostromers Gospel and Sviatoslav collected works. So this um, uh, church is located in Kiev. Uh, Mariana, please next. The manuscript of Ostromer Gospel is particularly interesting because in the afterword, the scribe, Deacon Gregory, wrote in detail about the circumstances of production and the time of work, using the vernacular language of Ruth that was old Ukrainian. Please, next. The Ukrainian feature of Ostromer Gospel is evident because of the sonority, sonority of Novgorod, Volodymyr, here we see Oro, Olo. Um, uh, by the way, do you know um, how we write them in Russian? Volodymyr, how it will sound in Russian? Mm. Vladimir. 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 Yeah, Vladimir. Right. In Ukrainian, we have the sonority Volodymyr. A uh, soft ending, infinitive ending T. Vin spit, vin prihodit. In Russian, uh, we say on spit, on prihodit. Uh, it's hard ending. In Ukrainian, it's soft ending. Soft ending T at the end of the word. Bliznets, um, otets, divitsa. It's also specific Ukrainian. In Russian, we have here uh, um, hard C. Bliznets, otets. And uh, such specific Ukrainian grammar feature as vocative case, we use it to direct, uh, to, uh, to call as a person. And uh, masculine endings or the having dative case. Of course, in Russian, there is also endings of dative case, but it's uyu, it's shorter endings. This longer is uh, very specific for Ukrainian. Petrovi, Isusovi, Kesarevi. Let's go next. More than seven and a half thousand samples of graffiti from the 11th to early 18th centuries have been discovered on the walls of St. Sophia in Kyiv. There were informal, arbitrary inscribed inscriptions scrawled on the walls by the clergy and laity. In the earliest inscriptions, researchers have traced the distinctive feature of the Ukrainian language that distinguish it from other Slavic language, for example, ending of vocative and dative cases, uh, by the way, uh, could you read this? Could you recognize some letters maybe here or some word? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, yes, it's uh, not easy to recognize. Let's read it together. So here is written, Sviaty Pantelimone, Pomeiluj, 
раба своего Мартина. But we see here, we see here the evocative case, Pantelaimone. It's very uh, specific, typical for Ukrainian. Um, please, next. In the next graffiti, we read, Господи, поможи своєму рабу, грішному Лазарю, убогому, у своєму домі і помилуй його. Lord, help your poor sinner Lazarus in your home and have mercy on him. And here we see the dative case. Своєму рабу, грішному Лазарю, убогому. Uh, first we see убогому. It's Ukrainian word um, to say poor. In Russian it would be бедному. And we see here своєму. In Russian we say своєму рабу, своєму рабу. А uh, here we see своєму рабу, грішному Лазарю. Uh, the graffiti reflects the whole chronicle of life in Kiev and Rus. Despite all the attempts of Soviets to erase or paint them over, this graffiti testifies this, that the spoken language of Rus was the Ukrainian language. Mariana, please, next. In Kiev and Rus, two languages were in use. Uh, one was vernacular, old Ruthenian or, or old Ukrainian. It developed naturally between the 6th um, and 16th century and did not depend on written tradition. It was precisely this vernacular language that forms the basis of the Ukrainian language. The second language which was used in Kievan Rus was Old Slavonic or Church Slavonic. It was created by Cyril and Methodius in the 11th century, and it became the official language of business and church in Kievan Rus, as well as the language of old Ukrainian literature. It should be mentioned here that Church Slavonic has many variants, Kievan, Bulgarian, Serbian, etc. The Kievan variant of Church Slavonic was a language of a lead and formed the the language of old Ukrainian literature. But one of the variants of Church Slavonic also formed the basis, the basis of the Russian language. So Ukrainian and Russian have different origin. Ukrainian was formed in the sixth century on the basis of old Ruthenian, which was a spoken language of Kiev and Rus. Russian was formed later on the basis of one variant of Church Slavonic language, which was the written language of Kiev and Rus. Please, next. A prominent Ukrainian linguist, professor of Harvard and Columbia universities, a literary historian, George Yuri Shevelyov, who was of German heritage and um, whose works were banned in the Soviet Union, wrote, vernacular Ukrainian has never been old or common Ruthenian, never the same as Russian, never in its ancestor, descendant or branch. Ukrainian arose from Protoslavic and developed between the 16th, 6th and um, the 16th century. According to his research, we should talk about the Ukrainian language dating right from the 6th century, and it's not correct to call it common Ruthenian. Um, people, uh, people abroad often ask is if uh, Ukrainian and Russian are almost the same languages. Um, let's look how similar or different they are. Um, if you compare the systems of orthography and pronunciation of Ukrainian and Russian, um, then uh, despite the apparent similarity between both uh, alphabets, we shall discover a huge difference in the pronunciation of sounds. Please, next. For example, uh, here we see Ukrainian G, H. We have two sounds, two different sounds, G, H. In Russian, it's, it's only uh, G. Here we have Ukrainian E. Uh, in Russian, it's written in this way. It's Ukrainian E, but Ukrainian E is different than Russian E. Ukrainian E, it's close mid front vowel. We call it Vysoky Parednyi. Um, and Russian sound is more central vowel. It's also high, but it's central. So the difference, Ukrainian we, uh, Ukrainian we say E, and Russian we say E. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and you see here uh, other difference, but um, it seemed to be even a bigger challenge for Russian speakers to pronounce soft Ukrainian C at the end which was mentioned before yeah, in the graffiti. So let's look at this in next slide. Um, from the beginning of full-scale full invasion of Russia and Ukraine, the dozens of rhythmic lyrics and tongue twisters have been 
created and posted by Ukrainian social media, most of them contain Ukrainian words with soft C at the end. Because it's so hard for Russians to pronounce them, these words immediately became the shibboleth, a kind of language password during the war. Um, um, by the way, can someone translate this lyric on the left in, into, into English? I think if, Sabina has about the most knowledge. Uh, uh, no, no, no. Uh, Sabina, maybe I you can another, read this for us. I have another colleague here, Daniel. So the two of us, Daniel. Would you please read this? Uh... Uh, so um, I, I can try to translate it in, into English, but the problem will rather be the English and not the Ukrainian, I think. <laughs> so something like Ukrainian sort of bread, I do not know how to translate right, it correctly, right. mm -hmm. with the um, Geschmack in German, it would be of strawberry, um, are sold in the house, well, yeah, or in the shop close yeah. to the railway, Ukrainian <coughs> railway station, I suppose. Yeah, That's excellent. Right. You're right. So let's count uh, how many uh, these words we saw at the end do we have here. What's the number? Uh, this words we saw. Mm -hmm. We saw. We saw here, yes. Three. Three? Four. Yeah. Four. So I will show you fifth. Palianetsi, first. Polonetsi, second. Kremnetsi, three. Ukrzaliznetsi, four. But we have here the word prodajutsa. We pronounce these um, letters together and it sounds like tsi. Prodajutsa. So we have here five words with this uh, sound uh, tsi. Um, so we think the reason why Russians cannot pronounce soft tsa uh, correctly is that in Russian language, the sound tsi was historically hard, mm -hmm. uh, like ulitsa. Uh, in Ukrainian, it's vulitsa. In Russian, tsaritsa. Uh, in Ukrainian, it's tsaritsa. Moreover, all of the words on these slides contain also hard kny, palyanitsa, synitsa, sunitsa. Let's go next. People often consider Ukrainian and Russian so similar that they do not care how to transliterate the names of Ukrainian cities into English. That is why in 2018, uh, uh, the Ukrainian Ministry of Foreign Affairs launched an online campaign, Correct UA, which appeals to foreign media to use the correct spelling of Ukrainian cities. For example, the ministry urged uh, to use the Ukrainian transliteration Kyiv and not the Russian Kiev. Mm. And here we see some other example, um, Mikolaev, Odessa with, uh, with one S and Kharkiv. Uh, for us Ukrainians, correct spelling and pronunciation of our cities really makes a big difference. While it shows that we are being treated with respect as an independent subject without mediation of the run Russian language. Let's go next. The same campaign was launched for German language. Here you can see the recommended transliteration for Ukrainian cities in German. Uh, please support this campaign, Correct UA. Whenever you notice the incorrect spelling of Ukrainian geographic names, tag officials and spread the mes message in social media with hashtag Correct UA. Be sure the symbolic action help us to fight for our linguistic subjectivity on the world map. The Ukrainian and Russian languages differ not only of different systems of uh, orthography and pronunciation, but for the most they are different lexically because of their vocabularies. Ukrainian linguist Konstantin Tyshchenko measured lexical distance among the languages of Europe. In particular, he analyzed that data and uh, calculated the percentage of common and different vocabulary units in any two comparable languages. All the professors he must are disposed in the linguistic museum at Tarashevchenko Kyiv National uh, University. Some are also published in his book, Fundamentals of Linguistic Assistant Textbook, 2007. So that, that, that picture would show that lexically Ukrainian is closer to Polish than to Russian. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> mentioned this uh, but on a grammar level it says most it is 
perhaps even closer to Russian or can, can you say that? Uh, uh, we will see it later. Okay. Uh, so uh, according to his research, the scientific picture turned out to be different than everyday uh, myths. The distance between Ukrainian and Russian dictionary is 38%. Uh, it's the same as between Portuguese and French or between Dutch and English. Uh, some people think that Ukrainian differs um, from Russian just as Spanish from Portuguese or German differs from Dutch, but uh, uh, this distance is um, uh, bigger. The closest to Ukrainian are Belarusian, Polish and Slovak vocabularies, and the closest to Russian is Bulgarian, not Ukrainian. Mm -hmm. it's, it's lexically we see here, and um, let's go next. Lexically, the Ukrainian language is much closer to the West Slavic languages. Um, this becomes evident if you compare at least this short um, list of vocabulary. Here we see that Belarusian, Ukrainian, Polish, Slovak, and Czech share common vocabulary that uh, differs significantly from Russian. To make this commonality even more visible, Ukrainian words uh, in this table are written in Latin alpha alphabet. And we see here, Diakuyu, uh, and спасибо, кава, кофе, цукор, сахар, червоний, красний, цибуля, лук, година, час, рушник, полотенце, ранок, morning, утро, и building, будинок, здание. Mm -hmm. Let's go next. Semantic differences between the Ukrainian and Russian language, uh, languages are also significant. For example, a state in Ukrainian, держава, comes from держати, тримати, to hold. And the state for us Ukrainian is a place of our common and personal responsibility. We all should be united to hold and protect our state. Instead, a state in Russia is the land under the rule of Tsar, Hosudar, Hosudarstvo. From the conception of Hosudarstvo, the personal or communal responsibility excluded. There is the ruler and the resource who submit to his rule. And let's see next example. Um, let's compare words to name a married couple. In Ukrainian, we call a married couple podruzhya. This word derives from the words druh, podruha, a friend. So in a Ukrainian picture of the world, a married couple is expected to get along with each other as good friends do. Russian word supruhi derives from a notion of upryashka, a set of dried Animals, as we see a couple in Russian is meant to pull the yoke together. It's not about friendship or joyfulness, it's about hard work and suffering. And let's go to this, uh, Sabina, your question about commonality in grammar. Konstantin um, Pliščenko calculated, um, uh, while the Ukrainian language uh, possess 82 specific features. It shares with Russian only 11 common features in phonetics and grammar. Mm -hmm. That means that structurally Ukrainian is much closer to Belarusian, Czech, Slovak, and Polish also as lexically. Mm -hmm. So um, the Ukrainian language is not the same as the Russian because in fact, um, they differ lexically. Uh, they have diff different spelling and pronunciation systems. Uh, there are many semantic differences and also um, structural differences. And let's go next. Uh, an important conclusion can to be uh, made to all this. The Ukrainian language is not the same as the Russian, despite all the attempt to assimilate them. So let's consider the assimilation policy in the territory of Ukraine over the last century. Uh, during the last century, the Ukrainian language was a real battlefield uh, where Russification policy was taking place. In, uh, here you see uh, this uh, card uh, from Belgium, and this uh, red color, it shows uh, where the, the, um, the Russian state, the Russian imperial was, uh, and um, this other colors, it's other states. Um, and we see um, where Russian language was dominated. Let's go next. Um, but the Ukrainian language was not always forbidden 
uh, but uh, by, by uh, uh, Russian or later Soviet officials in the 1923-1932, there was a period of Ukrainianization when the Ukrainian language developed and spread rapidly. Ukrainianization took place within the policy of indigenization, according to which the power of the Union Republic and the population of cities in general had to be replen replenished with indigenous people of the Republic. In Ukraine, Ukrainians, in Belarus, Belarusians, um, in Ukraine, indigenization has turned to Ukrainianization. Due to this policy, the sphere of usage of the Ukrainian language were expanded mainly, but not only, in school education up to 80%, publishing houses 83%, and theaters 75%. <clears throat> Let's go next. Then the status of the Ukrainian language was def um, defined due to the system of assessment as the Ukrainian language was introduced into official business use. Here we can see a certificate of the Ukrainian language proficiency level received uh, by an accountant on passing the language assessment. Without such a certificate, it was not possible to find a job and it's Kyiv region 1928. The certificate says Ukrainianization will unite the city and the village and proficiency in Ukrainian is only the first step toward, towards full Ukrainianization. Let's go next. The standardization of orthography system and corpus also took place in the, at this time in 1928. And all in all Ukrainian conference was held in Kharkiv, then the capital of Ukraine. At this conference, the uniting orthography was adopted, the so-called Skripnikivka or Kharkiv um, orthography. It combined the linguistic features of Soviet Ukraine with the orthography of Galicia, where the spelling of foreign words came from. You can see the cover of Skripnikivka on the left. This orthography became a symbol of the unification of the Ukrainian language at the time when Ukrainian lands were still divided between different states. Another achievement of this period is publication of dictionaries. The most valuable among them is the extensive Russian-Ukrainian dictionary edited by, edited by Agatan Krimsky. Only three volumes of this dictionary were published, but the fourth, unfortunately, was later banned and removed from circula circulation under the Soviet regime. Now this dictionary is available, available on the portal R to Ukrainian Org UA. Um, this portal was specifically designed to provide an array of flexible search options. You can write there either Ukrainian or Russian words, and you will, will find um, a lot of translation from different um, uh, dictionaries. There you can find unique words which did not get into later Soviet dictionaries. The entire team working on this dictionary was killed. It seems that Soviet leadership was afraid that the Ukrainian language would surpass Russian in its vocabulary. Let's go next. In 1933, Soviet officials began to stop Ukrainianization. The network of Russian school was doubled. In 1958, um, educational system introduced free choice of uh, language of instruction. This automatically means the Russification of education. Ukrainian was pushed out of office work, scientific sphere, and book printing. All academic dictionary created in the 20s and 30s were banned and removed from circula circulation. Orthography, Skripnikivka was ba uh, banned. Linguists were killed such as um, Savolod Gantsov, Grigory Goloskevich, Olena Kurilo, Oleksa Senyavsky. Administrative re regulation of the structure of the Ukrainian language was initiated in order to bring it closer to Russia. To Russians, the Commission for the Work on the Language Front was responsible for this. They really call it Language Front at the time. Soviet officials spread the idea that the independent Ukrainian language is primitive and rural, that the Russian uh, is a privileged language and a language of world importance. Um, about the positive influence of the Russian language on Ukrainian and the harmony, harmony of Ukrainian-Russian bilingualism. Let's, uh, uh, um, um, let's look at this harmony. On this slide, we see how the percentage of the Ukrainian language at school decreased dramatically in the period from the 1930s to the 1980s. As you see from the slide, um, well, in 1933, 80% of children were educated in Ukrainian. In the late 80s, the number decreased almost twofold. Only 
47 and half percent attended Ukrainian schools. It's almost um, the twofold. Let's go next. In the 1950s and 1980s, uh, there was also a decrease of the usage of the Ukrainian language in all spheres of cultural life, from the publishing of books and magazines to the introduction of films and theater plays. Limited use of Ukrainian in the cultural sphere was accomplished by the propaganda of Russian as a language of high culture. Let's go next. However, as Soviet language policy was not limited to narrowing the scope of the Ukrainian language. It also interfered in the internal structure of the Ukrainian language. For example, letter G, vocative case, dual number, verb band, masculine dative case ending, which were different from Russian and which we uh, noticed uh, in this uh, old uh, Sofia um, uh, graffiti, they were uh, also banned. The orthography of foreign words was brought closer to the Russian standard. It seems unbelievable, but there was even a special list of forbidden Ukrainian words comprised and shared with the publishing houses, newspapers, and magazines to eliminate certain, certain hostile Ukrainian lexemes from usage. Borisa Demska Kulchitska has mentioned in the book, The Ukrainian Language in the 20th Century, History of Lingua Sites, that uh, Soviet language policy was aimed not only at limiting the use of the Ukrainian language, but also at destroying its foundations, lexical, grammatical, phraseological. The purpose of this policy was to reduce the Ukrainian language to the state of jargon or dialect of the Russian language. And here we see the way uh, Lenin's works were translated at the time. So it was not uh, possible to translate it uh, differently than it was in Russian. Uh, in Ukrainian, we accept uh, Svoboda, um, freedom. We have also Volya. It was not possible to use because it was different in Russian. And uh, Russian Raskol in Ukrainian, we have Raslam. It was not possible to use. And let's go next. Um, the above mentioned Yuri Shevalyov has aptly summarized the, uh, the results of Soviet language policy in the following. In Soviet Ukraine, the conflict between the Ukrainian and Russian languages was transferred from the external non-linguistic sphere inside the language itself. The struggle took place not only in the human mind, but in the language itself. And um, uh, let's look at the results of this politics. Next slide. The Ukrainian language is still struggling with the rudiments of Soviet language policy when the benchmark of standardization was the Russian language. On this slide, we see the paths that most borrowings from English to Ukrainian take today. Unfortunately, Ukrainians often borrow English words through Russian. This is especially evident in words with the sound uh, H, which in Ukrainians uh, should be transliterated as H, but it um, is transmitted as H according to the model of the Russian language. So we, the way we say in English, hobby, we should say in Ukrainian hobby, but we write it hobby because it's in the way Russians do. Uh, second hand, the same, we should say second hand, but we write it second hand and so on. Uh, and let's go to, uh, uh, and another result of Soviet language policy um, is that we, now we have two standards of Ukrainian orthography. One is the Russified version of Ukrainian language. And the second is the diaspora version. They are different. In 2000s, as a new edition of the Ukrainian orthography was adopted, which tried to combine these two versions of the Ukrainian language by means of parallel forms. And according to a new edition, we can write, for example, radosti and radosti. We can write hete and gete. Uh, by the way, Goethe, yes, in uh, Deutsch, uh, Cathedra and Cathedra. So it's um, uh, the way to combine the two, tradition, two traditions in one. In one. But uh, we have a lot of fights on the ground of orthography uh, between these two variants. And let's uh, go to our last question, language and identity in Ukraine. Um, Yes, according to the pool conducted by the sociological group Rating on March, uh, March 19, 2022, throughout Ukraine, 76% considered Ukrainian a native language, and only 20% called Russian a native language. 
over the last decade, the number of those uh, who consider Ukrainian their mother tongue has uh, grown from uh, 57% to 76. The number of those considering Russian as a mother tongue has dropped from 42% to 20 over the course of 10 years. Uh, but it's also important to take into consideration language practice because the way people declare is one thing and the way they talk uh, to their, uh, um, at, at home, it's different. So 48% uh, respondents use Ukrainian language at home, a 33 use both Ukrainian and Russian, and 18% use only Russian, and 1% use other languages. So let's go next. What is important, uh, two thirds of those who use two languages in their everyday life have declared readiness to switch exclusively to Ukrainian soon. Among Russian speakers, one set is ready to use Ukrainian. And um, uh, let's go next. Volodymyr Kolek provides research on identity and language issue in Ukraine. He states that today in Ukraine, national identity uh, matters more than linguistic, and especially after the, uh, this repeat uh, change happened after 2014 and uh, now after the full scale invasion. People speak Russian more than they believe they are Russians. And everybody in Ukraine is Ukrainian. They consider themselves, themselves Ukrainian, either Russian speaking or Crimea Tatar Kremlin. Uh, so Ukrainian identity is civic, ethnic identity. It's not a linguistic. And one more suggestion uh, in next slide um, by Volodymyr uh, colleague. Um, as a result of Russian full-scale invasion of Ukraine, there is a growing trend toward Ukrainian identification in all regions of the country and a negative attitudes toward everything related to Russia and Soviet Union. Uh, Vladimir Kulik observes that there are a stronger embrace of Russian identity in all regions, um, that there, are, there is a shift in declared usage from Russian to both languages. We saw it in um, pool and um, declared willing willingness of Russian speakers and bilinguals to switch to Ukrainian as main, main language. And 80% Russian speakers say that they are not discriminated against in Ukraine now. Um, the personal story of Ukrainian writer Volodymyr Rafeyenko from Donetsk proves the language shift from Russian to Ukrainian. Until 2014, uh, he wrote only in Russian left from Kyiv after the occupation of his hometown, studied Ukrainian so that he could write fiction. And in 2019, he published the novel Mondegrin in Ukrainian. Both of his um, grandmothers were Russian speaking. One grandmother was born in a village where she grew up with Ukrainian. And when she got to the city, her classmate laughed at her incorrect Russian. She mastered Russian and gave up Ukrainian. His other grandmother also spoke Russian and she spoke Ukrainian only to cats and dogs because Ukrainian was the language of her childhood. Um, but she did not see a future in it. So she deliberately switched to Russian in the time of Russification policy. But today the situation has changed dramatically and many Ukrainians see their future and the future of their children connected with the Ukrainian language. And today, almost in every Ukrainian city, we have a um, language club and uh, uh, people try to master Ukrainian, try to um, uh, speak it. Uh, of course, uh, um, there are more people who declare this willingness than they actually do, but uh, this uh, language clubs exist. And let's look next. Uh, do you speak Surzhik? By the way, do you know what this Surzhik is? What's the kind of phenomena in Ukraine we have this kind of language? Well, well it's sort of a mixed language yes. between the two languages, Ukrainian and Russian. Yes, exactly. Something we use this, uh, this notion um, to talk about mixture of the Ukrainian and Russian, we don't speak about, uh, you, um, when we speak about Ukrainian and Polish, uh, we don't use this, um, this mixture. Only, uh, it, uh, because of the policy of falsification, we use the Surzhuk 
only uh, for this notion. And uh, it, it means a lack of proficiency that people um, know one of the language not so good, uh, not good and um, linguists build, build rules how to avoid Surjic um, and purify Ukrainian language from Russian uh, influences. And we have in our language courses in university, we also uh, teach to, um, um, to avoid surgic. But there are other aspects of this phenomena, and you see here this excellent book of Lada Bilanyuk. She is an um, 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 anthropologist uh, um, in the US. Uh, she has Ukrainian origin, and she wrote this book on tested tongues. And her main idea is that this mixture of two languages uh, can, have, can be a creative uh, phenomena. Uh, and people use it in a way to be funny, to build the commonality with other people. So it's have a lot of this creative potential, uh, of course. Um, so it's, um, let's go next. In uh, January 16, uh, 2021, the new language law came into force in Ukraine. It regulates the usage of the Ukrainian language in different spheres. For example, in the spheres of customer service, one can declare which language he or she prefers to speak. By default, the service must be provided in Ukrainian. And this girl has here uh, this, uh, please speak with me, uh, Ukrainian. Let's go next. And now we have two new institutions which patronize the Ukrainian language. Here you, you see Taras Kremen language ombudsman who is responsible for the protection of the Ukrainian language. In case the language law is violated, the witnesses of the incident can submit a complaint to his office and describe a concrete incident. And another uh, institution, it's National Commission on State Language Standards. Um, it organized proficiency level tests for foreigners, for those who want to acquire Ukraine citizenship, as well as for government officials. This institution also develops Ukrainian terminology and gender file language. Now we have three big official cultural institutions which protect the Ukrainian language inside and outside the country. They are Ukrainian Cultural Foundation, Ukrainian Book Institute, and Ukrainian Institute. We also have a lot of grassroots initiatives, three of them you see here. Interactive platform Slovotvir, Slovotvir.org.ua, you can check it where users can propose Ukrainian equivalents for borrowed words and vote for the best equivalent. And it's a good place to discuss the best equivalent. Um, it's interactive discussion happening there, as well as Portal Air to Ukrainian or QA with the excellent collection of old and modern Ukrainian Russian dictionaries, and Portal in uh, English to Ukrainian and uh, to Ukrainian or QA with the collection of Ukrainian English dictionaries. Although the Ukrainian language today contains the rudiments of Soviet language policy, it is protected by law and has official institutions so which are responsible for its protection and development. We are witnessing shift from Russian to Ukrainian and Ukrainian language is strengthening every day. And one of the way, way to make it uh, stronger uh, is to learn it. And uh, uh, then learning the Ukrainian language by foreigners really increases prestige in the world. One of our students from Lithuania uh, has mentioned the following. I have a thought to share. For me, Ukrainian is a foreign language. However, my hope is that as a foreigner, foreigner learning this language, this can raise the prestige of the language. For example, the Belarusian language severely lacks a prestige and it's seen as a language for villagers. My hope is that as a foreigner, it can help prevent the same problem from ever occurring for Ukrainian, not that it will. Thus, I am happy to be as a part of the School of Ukrainian Language and Culture, enhancing the development of the Ukrainian lingua didactics, contributing to the popularization of Ukrainian language in the world, and providing researchers on the language past, present, and future. Uh, thank you all for your attention. Slava Ukraini, and we are ready to answer all your questions. Okay. So thanks a lot, Olena. You gave us a, a deep insight also in the linguistic specific traits of Ukrainian. Uh, for me and Daniel, as uh, people with the Slavonic background, it has certainly been interesting and Daniel knows much more about it than I do at the moment. 
but I hope it was also uh, interesting or uh, um, illustrating um, about you know the, the the degree of differences to the others. And thank you also for um, giving us insight into the history of uh, the development of the language, the problem of Russification, and the current situation. And I think that specifically interesting to to a wider public is also the idea of identity. And of course, promotion of Ukrainian, we all are about for promotion of multilingualism. So Ukrainian is certainly making part of it. But I would really like uh, to use the chance we have uh, at least uh, 15 to 20 minutes left, if necessary, if, for, to, to give the chance to all colleagues present to ask questions to Olena or to Mariana. And yes, so, so please, the floor is yours. Or remarks, David. Yes. To, towards. Thank you very much for a very interesting and uh, illuminating presentation. The, towards the end, you had a slide that used the six proficiency levels of the Common European Framework, but I didn't understand exactly how you were using it. Can you can you say more about that? Perhaps even go back to the slide. And, and, and explain how you're using it. Okay, can you perhaps, Mariana, show again the slide or share the slide? Okay, thank yeah. you. So, so uh, are, are these levels equivalent to grades that are awarded on an exam, or, 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 or how does it work? Yes, Olena or Maria? Uh, yes, something happened. Uh, uh, you see here this uh, national commission, they use it um, for exam, but we use the scale for language teaching as well. We make the um, assessment for our students to uh, divide them in separate groups, but here the national commission, they use it uh, for uh, assessment, mm -hmm. as a scale of assessment, and um, unfortunately I don't see this slide right now. Uh, so here we see that, um, uh, yes, uh, so uh, uh, um, for Ukrainian uh, citizenship, the yeah. uh, 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 is needed, and for um, uh, to work um, as an, um, in, in state institutions, so it's needed. Um, this Vilna Volodinia. Is it C1 or C2 then? C1, I think. C1, okay. Yeah. Yes, that, that, I, I can understand how you would attach those, um, those levels to the um, kinds of uh, activity that you just referred to. What I don't understand where the percentage comes in, 30 to 39, 40 to 49, 50 to 50. Uh-huh. Uh -huh. I understand. It's um, the amount of uh, right answers, uh, the correct answers. Okay. So it's the, um, how many correct answers should be. People don't need to, to make everything 100% um, correct. Well, you'll forgive me for saying that your state commission or whatever it's called needs a lesson in the common European framework because that's a complete misuse of the system. Mm -hmm. So did, did, did I understand correctly? Um, Olena, you wanted to say you start with a corpus of of, of uh, tasks, or where there's a and if you do everything correctly, hundred percent, you would be awarded a C two level. Is that correct, or is it that you have uh, tasks to fulfill on A one, A two, B one, and so on level? And within these tasks, oh, no, it's no, 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 it's different. Uh, yeah. to, it's different kind of. Uh, assessment because one is mm. for, to acquire Ukrainian citizenship. It's another test. Mm. And uh, for professional purposes, it's different. Yeah. 
it's not the same. Yeah. Uh, yes, but just we saw, the same. Uh, yeah. Just they mm -hmm. just saw the level, the level in the website. Mm -hmm. This is information from the website. Yeah. So, but it would mean that, for example, you have a test on B one level, yes, to acquire your citizenship, and you have to fulfill in these tests uh, 50, 50 to fifty nine percent of the tasks correctly. Is is that the point? Or yes, yes, yeah. they just uh, they don't want to make it too hard for people. So. Mm -hmm. But the tasks are competence-based tasks, as you would know from the European framework, yes. In the different in different skills and yes, it's different skills, yes. Yeah. Um, may I ask you, Alana, do you think they are, they've already completed the process? Just because I think it's still a going-on process on developing all those tests. The only one which is just actively used right now is the one for professional right, use for those who would like to work in public services. Mm. Yeah. Uh, so I think it works with that one. Just be, uh, I'm not sure about the general proficiency of the language, just because as far as we know, um, a year ago at least, it was still in the process mm -hmm. and i don't think that during the war they will they, they just mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. much uh with that uh so i mean uh the process was connected with just designing the whole test which was uh competency based as you mentioned it was not just a one unified test test and then which was assessed by percentage and and it was not due to the percentage that the level was identified was estimated right it was more about competencies so that each level will have a separate uh test to prove the proficiency level of the learner okay that's, at least well, what that's, that's, that's exactly that's exactly what one would expect but uh, then i don't understand what these percentages are 30 to 39 40 to 49 and so on i, I, I think well as olena mentioned um it, it's from their side from the side of this national commission and as far as i know they deal only now with this uh test for uh public service uh, professionals like if you want to have a position in government everyone has to take this one specific test and i believe this concerns this professional uh, test only that's for mainly for ukrainian speakers just to prove that they are proficient in so proficient in the language that they can just um fulfill their duties in the government but they provide also as this uh, assessment for foreigners as I do it also. Do you mean the same one? Hmm? Do, you, do you mean the same test? No, 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 it's the same. It's different. It's uh, it's different, of course. Okay. Um, can, may I ask you something? I was impressed to see that most of your students to move to your school and your activities, and they seem to come from uh, the US and Canada and Australia, then less from uh, European countries. Um, you certainly know more about the motivations of the students. I mean, I, I have learned you you you, uh, you, uh, you give credits, which then can be counted to their degree in the home countries. But could you tell us something more about the motivations of, of the students to learn Ukrainian? Uh, these are, thank you for the question, Sabina, because I think this is the most interesting part about our students it is always so um amazing to learn what motivates them usually these are um their uh, it's just their willingness to find their roots to go back to their roots because they are of ukrainian heritage yeah. but um we have noticed recently that there are more and more uh, students who do not have any Ukrainian descendants, but they are willing to learn the language either for their professional goals, like researchers, especially historians or uh, political uh, scientists, but um, or let us say um, the Ukrainian priests, which is really amazing 
because uh, we have a bunch of students who joined the Ukrainian church overseas just because they liked the rites, the, uh, the, the, uh, the canons of the, the religion. And uh, being not Ukrainians, they joined the church and then they just want to become priests Mm -hmm. uh, or just parishioners and be able to communicate with uh, with their community. Another amazing uh, uh, motivation. Apart from that, uh, and this is my favorite, I would say, uh, group of students, those are the ones who are driven by their personal or let's say um, emotional um, motivation just because they found someone, someone let's say their uh, um, better half who is of Ukrainian descendants. And then that's the best motivation ever. Just because once you love someone, you want to, uh, to show this appreciation by speaking the language of your beloved one. And that's really amazing how many people we make happy. It's, you know, just making people happy, happy making couples like, uh, become a family. Um, Apart from that, that, I do remember um, we had a student from the Netherlands who was so much interested in the language that later he became a professor of Ukrainian and he wrote a, a textbook of his own on the difference of the uh, language structures of the um, Dutch and the Ukrainian and it's yeah. really a popular one nowadays. So, so have, have, you, have you observed an increase? Uh, just an additional question, then I have seen your hand on Daniel. Uh, have you observed an increase in interest also due to the war? I mean, which is a very, of course, tragic reason. But since people, I think many people wouldn't know a lot about Ukraine or in Europe or Ukrainian language. And now uh, through this war, and, and, you know, the, the, the fact that they feel uh, uh, kind of, you know, concerned uh, on different levels, uh, politically, emotionally, that they, 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 did it also create or could you also observe an increase in interest in, in, the, in the language? Uh, well, um, I would say the interest has tremendously increased, especially outside of Ukraine. Mm -hmm. which is uh, I believe we will have this increase in our summer programs, which are still to come, mm -hmm. uh, the future ones in Ukraine, I mean, because it needs to be online. Otherwise, as far as I know, those professors who left Ukraine and, that, and are now um, abroad, they are um, intensely involved in Ukrainian courses, which um, the number of which just increased because of the war. People seem to be really interested in, uh, I would say, the, the reasons, as I mentioned, in the Ukrainian identity to understand who we are and why we are invaded. What are the reasons for the um, an understandable invasion for a lot of them? So to understand the language, what's behind it, to understand the history of the people. And as Olena demonstrated by one of her slides, uh, just to support the language. In that way, people feel involved as they are supporting the country by supporting the language mm -hmm. and the people. All different kinds of support world work these days. So we are, we are really grateful to, to everyone. Thank you. Daniel, you had a question. Yes. Uh, first of all, thank you very much, Mariana and Olena, for your presentation and for the work you do to promote uh, your language and to, to defend also your, cu your culture, of course, especially in this, uh, these weeks. Um, a few words about myself. So I'm Daniel. I, I'm a philologist. I teach Russian language at um, Language Center in Zurich. And I've been learning Ukrainian for a few years now, so I love Russian language, I love Ukrainian language. And I have a, a lot of questions, but I will start with one or two. The first uh, concerns the lexical differences. Was it Dyschenko, the name? 
right? Mm -hmm. So what is, the, what is the difference? What is the lexical difference? Uh, to give a few examples, you have the Russian word for milk, which is malako, and it's the same in Ukrainian, just you pronounce it differently, but it's written in the same way. Is it a difference? Or another example, you have the Russian word chas and Ukrainian word chas. It's but it's different meaning. Yes, uh, that's what I wanted to add. So where does the difference start? Different start, mm -hmm. and what does it mean difference? Does the word need to be recognizable? Or what, what is the different and when it, is it not a different? I cannot see the point. Yeah. I'm the sure Tishenko is saying something about it, but I have not read yes, it. As I, uh, as I understood uh, his work, that uh, the difference is like Tsukur and Sakhar. Mm -hmm. Here is the difference. So, so etymologically speaking, in the end. Um, because I, I guess there are different roots. Well, uh, yes, sure, different not... roots, they came from different languages, yes. Mm. From different languages, okay, mm -hmm. okay. Okay, thank you very much. It, uh, he, he look, uh, what is similar vocabulary and why is different? Okay. Yeah. But so, I mean, but... Yeah, we are entering now uh, really linguistic uh, things because I think etymologically, Tukar and uh, Sakhar is the same, but it's just a different phono uh, phonological development. But perhaps, uh, Daniel, you, you had another question, you said, or? Yes, and uh, yeah, maybe a second question, if there's still some time left, it's about how you could or should write now, for example, the names of Ukrainian cities in other languages. So you, you've given us also the map of the, with the German words. Mm -hmm. I agree quite with the direction of uh, what it wants. So I think it works with Kyiv, it works with Chernihiv in German. But uh, the problem here is that we must talk also about the rules of pronunciation of the other languages. And when you take the word of Odessa, then it's with two S in Russian, with one S in Ukrainian. Now, if you write it in German with one S, we are obliged to pronounce it like Odessa. And I think it's the same in French and it's the same or mm -hmm. something different in English. I think you would read something like Odessa, or mm -hmm. I don't know, you can correct me, uh, David. So I see a problem here also with this. Mm -hmm. So I would prefer nevertheless to S in German because then it will sound closer to the Ukrainian word Odessa. You see. Yes, this um, transliteration of Ukrainian geographic name is a big topic uh, uh, and uh, um, from German to Ukrainian or as well. Um, I know there is such a group of linguists in Lviv. Um, they are translators from different languages and they work on this um, uh, application um, for, for different languages and they have already um, developed for uh, Chinese and for German. And there you can write German uh, geographic names and uh, it, it will uh, tra um, transmit it to Ukrainian and you'll write how to, but it's really a, a big uh, question, uh, which rule we uh, use as a uh, core of this uh, transmission. And it's um, a big question to, for discussion really. Okay, thank you. Thank David, you, you, you have also got another question, please. Yeah, thank you, uh, Sabina. Yeah, I wanted to ask about the Ukrainian diaspora, because in one of your slides you talked, I think, about two orthographic systems. Mm -hmm. am, I, am, am I right? And you associated yes. one with, with the diaspora. Uh, and really the question I have is in two parts. The first part is, where are the largest concentrations of Ukrainian immigrants? Um, outside Ukraine, and 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 secondly, are, are there any organisations that support the maintenance of, of of Ukrainian as the language of these uh, communities? Mm -hmm. Thank you. So this question about diaspora language, um, this diaspora variant, uh, it is built on the orthography of nineteen twenty eight. This oh. Ukrainian kind of photography and people moving overseas, they uh, brought uh, they bring brought the language of their native towns of their native villages where they lived, and um, as, um, this not recified Ukrainian language are preserved there. Of course, it it um, has developed under the Rus uh, under the English influence. Also, it's not so. 
uh, but um, uh, it's different than so Soviet Ukrainian language. And uh, we have this uh, uh, big public uh, discussion, a lot of public discussion, which way is the right way to develop Ukrainian, this or this, this is Russified, this is, and it's a um, big problem. So uh, I think that the biggest Ukrainian diaspora is in US and Canada, Mariana, yeah. what do you think? Mm -hmm. yeah. The, uh, and it's very special place I say, because uh, uh, there we have Ukrainian community um, in um, Ukrainian church. They develop uh, um, uh, Sunday uh, schools for children, language schools. So uh, they preserve their language there um, for hundreds of years, thanks yeah. to the community, to the, that they um, build their community there. There's a large Ukrainian community in Edmonton in Western Canada that has a very lively cultural life. Um, I mean, I happen to know because I've been there, that's that's all just the kind of stuff one gathers as uh, someone who moves about. But thank you. Um, well, I can tell this from the experience and I would say that um, it depends on the generation. More and more uh, younger people living in diaspora they are willing to adopt this modern Ukrainian rules, just not to sound different. Just because they visit modern Ukraine, they have chance to communicate with their peers in Ukraine. And all of a sudden they discover that they sound a little bit old fashioned. So there's this tendency in here, at least in Canadian schools, Ukrainian schools, just to introduce the modern Ukrainian uh, way of speaking, way of writing and the orthography. But I believe just out of our discussion, you can see that there's much to be done, mm -hmm. and especially together in cooperation with the linguists from other countries, other languages, just because we lost a lot. We were deprived of developing our language over decades. And this, these are the consequences. That's why we are having so much, so many debates on different topics, just because it was an um, unnatural process. Uh, so we are just kind of, you know, reviving, uh, coming back to life. And yes, we, we somehow need help. We need to first to find ourselves, to find it for ourselves. And then with the help of others, just to understand how, let's say, the transliteration, which you mentioned. Yes, that's very essential to discuss it with the uh, speakers of other languages, just because, as you mentioned, what sounds okay for us may sound a little bit inappropriate for others. Mm -hmm. So we are open, I think, for the discussion, for the professional discussions, and we will be grateful to all the ideas of yours. Okay. Thank you very much. Just to finish our talk, I think that Ukraine has had, uh, has lived a huge challenge and has uh, had to face big uh, issues, a lot of issues and, and uh, even has had to fight a lot of battles against uh, Sov Sovietification or Russification of the language. Now, our Western languages, uh, of course, are, are um, under the influence of multilingualism. So we have a lot of trans languages going on in, in our countries. We have a lot of issues linked to the influence of migrant languages. So uh, it's very interesting. It will be interesting how, how much, to what degree also the Ukrainian language and hopefully soon in with a after the war with the in Ukraine which has also a, perhaps even more interaction with other languages and other countries so how much to or to what degree these other uh, European languages might also have an influence so this just crossed my mind because I understand that historically and driven by the current terrible situation you think a lot about freeing Ukrainian from the Russian uh, Russification history. But I think there will be other like um, other challenges ahead and interesting you know, developments ahead. And um, when you speak about young people and meeting, you know, going abroad now also, or living abroad now, even due to a very tragic situation, they, they, they their uh, Ukrainian will also be influenced and when, when they come back or when they will interact with other uh, speakers of other languages, this will also have an impact on their language. So I think it's just to 
uh, perhaps conclude also on a linguistic level and on a circles <laughs> community level. This will be interesting to observe. And I'm very happy that uh, I think uh, you, Olena, you will come to the circles conference, yes? Yes. Yes, and some other colleagues also. Mm -hmm. Mariana, you, I don't know about you, probably you can't, you can't do it. Unfortunately. I'm sorry. But we will hopefully meet then, or we'll live to the day where we will have a circles conference in Ukraine. Uh, we have one every two years, and uh, so, but it will be also an occasion at the conference to interact with some uh, of Ukrainian colleagues, and we are very much looking forward to that. And thank you very much again for, for the giving us this insight into your language and its history and um, the current challenges. And we wish you all the very best, personally to the two of you, uh, to your school, yes, uh, and um, uh, to your country, of course. So Thank see you. you at another occasion and have a, a nice evening, everybody. And thanks for participating. We will hope that uh, the recording will be, we will also promote it, will be, um, uh, watched by a lot of colleagues who did not or could not attend uh, this evening. So all mm -hmm. the very best and have a nice evening. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. bye, -bye. Thank you. bye, -bye. bye, -bye. bye.